Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our fourth event in the online portion of the Sovereign Intimacies exhibition. I'm Jennifer Smith, one of the co-curators of Sovereign Intimacies, an exhibition put on in partnership between Gallery 1C03, Plugin ICA, and with support of Video Pool Media Art Centre. I am the guest curator for Gallery 1C03, and I have had the absolute honour and privilege to co-curate this exhibition with Nazrin Himada, the curator at Plugin ICA. Um, we are here today on Treaty 1 territory, the territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and homeland of the Métis Nation. For me, this land acknowledgement is about acknowledging my Métis ancestors who have always inhabited the lands in and around Winnipeg. I'm going to uh, hand this over to Nazrin to talk a little bit more about the Sovereign Intimacies Project. I was muted. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to uh, just situate myself. Um, I am, as Jen mentioned, the curator at Plugin ICA, uh, which is on Treaty One territory. Um, and the way that I landed on, in Winnipeg and got here, uh, and I just want to take a, a few steps back, is that my family was uh, not able to have a life on the lands and territories in which they're from, which is Palestine, uh, in a part of Palestine called Tarshiha. Um, they had to escape uh, by foot across the borders into Lebanon in 1948. Um, and then later on through the colonial systems that enforce migration and that enable further colonial conquest by way of immigration in what is currently called Canada, my parents were able to make a life here since 1989. I've mostly lived uh, in Jojiage, uh, which is what is called Montreal right now. Uh, and that is the longest place I've ever lived consecutively in my life. Um, and I have the honor and privilege to call uh, that place my home. Uh, I moved here just a year and a half ago uh, and, and was able to now work and, and meet uh, amazing people here like Jen on Treaty One territory the territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I also just want to take a few minutes to introduce um, uh, or tell you a little bit about Sovereign Intimacies, our exhibition uh, that, as Jen mentioned, we uh, co-curated together that was up at Plugin until we unfortunately had to close our doors uh, because of the new health restrictions. Um, but we're so happy and excited to have this extensive online programming, uh, which tonight is the fourth program, and we still have uh, two left, so that is very exciting. Sovereign Intimacies is a group exhibition um, that really came out of and was cultivated from a, a relationship that was already building with Jen. Um, it, it explores themes of cultural and community exchange between indigenous artists and racialized artists from the diaspora. Um, and that term has been, uh, um, we've had a lot of conversations around the term diaspora. And I think uh, throughout these conversations, it has been expanded on and complicated further uh, through different interlocutors and uh, collaborators. And one thing that has come out of many conversations and that sticks out for me is that this term can also apply to the indigenous experience on these lands and not just for those who come from elsewhere. As we know, colonization has manifested in a way where borders were drawn, where there were none. For us, the term diaspora has come to present something quite specific, but also expansive. So I'd like to just read a little from the essay that Jenna and I wrote for the exhibition to touch on what it is we are grappling with when it comes to these relations. Uh, the essay is written as a conversation between Jen and I, and here I'm responding to Jen. This exhibition is for us. When I refer to us, I mean you and me and all the artists we have worked on, on this with, and for our friends and family and the communities who desire conversations between us. We who come from a lineage of people impacted by colonial and white supremacist violence. In order to emphasize the ways in which through our struggles, love and care and joy, we build our solidarity. So for me, the curatorial ethics we have built together with the artists and through encounters with their artworks are grounded in relations and in the question of how do we continue to show up for each other? 
It is through this intention that I believe liberation manifests in these intimacies that are sovereign. So for the artists presented in this exhibition offer forms of collectivity that are based on the principles of taking time, of learning, of listening, of letting the process guide the work. Each in their own way, the artists have provided a space in which to consider intimacy as active, as action, and as change. And I want to also just make a point that when we speak of the exhibition, we don't separate the public programs from the exhibition itself. And the exhibition in all its forms features the work of Hassan Ashraf, Annie Beach, Ayumi Goto, Iris Yurihu, Melanie Monaceros, Peter Morin, Mariana Minos Gomez, Wanda Nanabush, M. Norbese Philip, Megan O'Brien, Marianne Redhead, Cheyenne Thomas, and David Thomas. So I'm so excited that uh, tonight's poetry reading uh, is part of this program and so honored to have Mel here with us tonight and I'm going to pass it on back to Jen. Thanks Nazarin. Um, so I would just like to, uh, before we begin, just send a, a shout out of thank you to Jennifer Gibson from Gallery 1C03 who has helped organize this event and has been an integral part of organizing the exhibition as a whole. Um, also, thank you to Evan from the University of Winnipeg, who is helping out with the live stream, and Joanne McKenzie from National Captioning Canada, who is providing us with closed captioning this evening. And thank you to all of the team at Plugin ICA who have worked um, and contributed to this program and the exhibition. I'm so thrilled to have Melanie Monaceros with us this evening to share their poetry with us. For me, Melanie is a guidepost for revolutionary acts of care. Uh, Melanie Monaceros is a poet and interdisciplinary artist exploring polysensory production and somatic grief through text slash aisle or textile and text. Uh, their work considers the collective crit, queer and crit consciousness by connecting to marvelous bodies living with complexities and sick or, or as sick or disabled. A Black Teano Arawak creator they live on Treaty One territory uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In 2019, Melanie was awarded the JRG Emerging Artist Award for their continued pursuit, uh, integrating technology and accessibility through film via their series, Ancestor Radio. Ancestor Radio. Um, welcome, Mel. I'm so, so thrilled to have you. I'm going to hand the evening over to you. Um, there will be some time for Q&A at the end, and you'll notice that there is a spot at the bottom of your screen where you can enter your questions. Um, so once Melanie's done, uh, done her reading, or their reading, we will, um, at that point, then facilitate uh, the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And <clears throat> Oh my goodness, thank you to everyone who's making this happen. Um, and for everyone that's joining, uh, hi, <laughs> hope you're having a really good evening. Um, yeah, it's been um, it's kind of a strange, special um, way to share art this year uh, virtually and um, kind of build these different ways of connecting with folks and um, making space for art and for a connection to live. So um, yeah, so thank you to everyone that's making this happen. Um, yeah, and I please, I invite your questions and comments afterwards. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna share some words with you. Nice to meet you. How many languages do I speak these words? N, T, M, Y. Flat hands together, number one hand shape together. Point, inhale, sip, smudge, swallow. Purple roots, soft leaves cut above ground, lay in boiled water, not boiling. Be gentle with the fronds. This leaf grows this way here, but not there. What does the medicine look like where you grow? Washed lightly in soft smoke healing, my mind flashes to the static image 
of a brightly lit blonde, white and blue woman. A smile stretched across her colonizing face. Her caption shouts her anticipation for her new book about herbal healing wands, healing wands, smudging rituals it's called. White people are so skilled at ruin. At home, I open my door to the faint sweetness of sandalwood hanging in the air. My dead mother's favorite, so says her last living bestie. In the aftergulf of this tea, sage and sweetgrass and earthy tang recall Cerisee and Senna to my tongue. A nervine bitterness, dark jewel-toned elixir, more malachite than emerald. The darkness rich in tonic and temporality. So many stories to undo. Bypassing my in-progress embroidery hoop en route, to the, en route to this notebook, I wonder to myself again if writer is the right word for my purpose. Am I still a writer if all I wanna do is have my hands ever busy with strands and tension? The stories that float as phrases in my mind dissolve into indecipherable dust as soon as I ask them into English. I want it to come easy and feel clear like when treadling patterns finally made sense and another world I hadn't known to miss came into sharp focus. I could say I've lost faith in language, but that would be a half truth. My dialect is merely expanding. Welcome home, O oh loom of mine. What will your name be, I wonder? Becoming a weaver feels like the first years of being out and queer when I saw homos everywhere. Every asymmetrical haircut, every septum piercing, every hanky wearing fashionably other person I came across. Could this be my new kin or lover? Now every rag, patch, towel, scrap I encounter of cloth, fabric, leaf of skin, I am drawn into its construction and the desire to know how its weave runs. Woven viscera visible in everything I touch. I learned a pattern today. I practiced mathematics and geometric fiber alchemy. Idea into symbol and shape into pattern and repeat into spool and peg into warp and weft into cross and chain and choke threaded through, read through, read and dream and hand into memory and artifact. I learned a pattern today. Restless ocean. What is there in my restless oceans? Wide future promised? Audrey Lord. <clears throat> she knew I was leaving here before she left here. She gave me her blessing in the language she could. The sea turns, the sea turtles emerge, submerge again. What ancient creatures appear when the tide goes out on Venus, Pluto, Mars, 
How many millennia does an extraterrestrial thick skinned water piece remember? They call her radio. You could always count on her for hourly updates of on anyone in or connected to the family. You call her radio, her knowledge seemed to stretch across earthly memory. She spun cords of connection across time, space and distant all before and without the internet. In one of my other lives, I was or will be a centuries old Galapagos tortoise. Move through time slow, rhythmic. Stretch my neck out for crisp, crunchy leaves and baptizing myself in the sun. Carry myself in my own home and armor. Birth beaches of babies I leave to the sea. Trust the prayers. Trust my prayers. Trust the waters. Ode to queer, black, and brown weavers. <clears throat> D. B. I live for the initials monogrammed in Sharpie on all visible sides of your wooden shuttle. Clear and legible along the top where its most frequent touch is the brush of weft threads along its vanished length. Faded and worn along the front where I imagine your thumb rests and presses as you cast the canoe from left to right. The words, the worlds roll on waves across reeds, dreamed from the depths of soul and ocean. I A. The first time I warped a four harness loom, I thought of your hands. Soft, quick, brown, muscular from fine motor repetition, your hands. Black and yen queer fingers through a curtain of taut white warp thread. I knew how much torque this frame could take from picturing your frame in plank across the, across the castle. Textile tool choreography. RK. When I remember to come home, to come into my breathing at the front beam, I thank your rootedness and the way you co-create with your body as anchor offering the depth of your knowledge to curious and uncertain hands, sharing it with fingers knotted from seasons of stitch work. You cast nets to catch the heft of persistent empirical tyranny rendered in finest silk. When the algebra of treadling overwhelms my synapses and self-doubt whispers insults of ignorance and inability, this lineage of queer kin threadbearers catch my dropped stitches and drooping shoulders, reignite my fiber fire and together we weave. Heaving our deep set histories, our desk whispered fantasies, forward, skyward, onward in cloth. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, you know, please feel free to put your questions in the, the Q&A box. Um, it's okay, I would love to ask a question to begin. Um, uh, there was one line that you talked, where you said that you were like the tortoise um, and, uh, and the slowness. And I wanted to ask you to talk a bit more about slowness um, and use of time. Um, and I guess bringing that both into poetry, the performative aspects of, of doing a poetry reading, but also those connections to textile making. Um, so I have always been a very slow person. I, I was a slow child. I was the last in class. Um, I was the last in line. I was always, I'm always slow. I've always moved slowly. And so I've always um, 
intersected with a world that doesn't move slowly. Um, and I've always been asked to go faster and I've always tried to go faster um, because, you know, my friends or my family or my job didn't uh, make room or didn't uh, have time for me to be slow. And so, you know, in the last, you know, few years where I've been, um, you know, fortunate enough to okay. create my own practice and, and to, um, yeah, have a space that I can kind of cultivate slowly. Um, and I've really been able to kind of sit more in that. And so as someone who's chronically ill, um, in my particular body, uh, moving quickly doesn't usually yield <laughs> uh, great results. Um, and so even learning how to remove my body when it kind of changed um, and my illness kind of changed um, has, you know, forced me in some ways to either spend a lot of time trying to go faster or um, being somewhat at peace with the slowness and the pace that I go at. Um, and so also uh, textiles are not super quick <laughs> when they're by hand. Um, and that seems that's just where my, uh, my interests, some of my interests lie. So um, as much as I desire to be able to make like so many more things than I can, I just, you know, these hands can only do so much. So um, I try to <laughs> offer slowness around me when I can um, and invite it when, when I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mel. Wow, thank you for that beautiful reading. That was really, I haven't um, heard you read your poetry before. So it was just such a delight. And also, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, I wanted to, I think as Jen and I have been talking about this a lot because of what's coming up for us a lot in this exhibition around sovereign intimacies. And I feel that your poetry and your work also in other aspects of your work touch on this as well. And, you know, I just heard this incredible interview with Billy Ray Belcour, who talks about this relationship of joy with freedom. And I feel like from what I am seeing and gathering, I feel you cultivate that in your practice and also in your politics and also what you're saying about offering a kind of slowness, I feel like is, is definitely connected to a kind of um, liberatory, um, yeah, value around how it is to cultivate joy in your everyday life. And and I don't think when I say joy, I don't mean just like happiness or, you know what I mean, but it's, it's really a, something that comes from deep within that also expands the world outside of us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I think to just being um, being humans <laughs> ish ish I'm human ish, um, but like being the beings that we are on the lands that we are, like we've seen what happens when we go fast. Like um, you you can't really build a lot of really you know super consensual relationships if you're not listening because you can't because you don't have time because that's the structure of how your industry works or how your whatever works and so. You know, like I feel, um, I do feel a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, turmoil sometimes about being such a slow person and being um, someone who um, has had has chosen sometimes when I can to like choose my slowness and to choose my joy um, and to choose my safety and my access and my care over. Um, moving in a way that the world might move or, um, but it also, um, you know, it impacts so much of, you know, I think a lot of, in my work and, and other things, like I think so much about care, um, which um, I feel like is such a through thread um, with, with sovereign intimacies and just thinking about, 
your, your, not your essay, your conversation. Um, and, um, the grief also is a thing that I work with and I think about it with land and I think about landscape empathy and being, um, you know, impacted by colonial things that have happened on streets that you're walking on or forests that you're walking through, um, but not, uh, um, not knowing, knowing that it's like in the world around you, it's not necessarily like slow enough to feel that out um, or to talk that out. Um, and especially with grief, especially with loss, capitalism is just, it doesn't give us time to grieve. Um, and as black and indigenous people, we are like grieving kind of consist, you know, and as cyclical as BIPOC people, there's a lot of grief to hold that the world doesn't give us a lot of time to do. And um, it impacts our bodies. Um, it impacts how we love each other. It impacts our capacity to love ourselves. Um, and every like little bit of, um, every little bit of liberation I give myself that I can share with someone else by like being a slow person by like being a person who can hold a lot of grief, who can like be like, oh yeah, let's talk about all the dead things. Like, it's really shitty. Let's talk about all the dead things. And like, um, I feel like hmm, I do a lot of hand things, but yeah, I feel like if I'm this being, everything that I'm doing, everything that each of us does is, is a ripple into whoever we're next to, whether we know them or not. And um, if I, um, if I ripple really quickly, then I don't get back the kind of depth and the kind of um, intimacy that I want to build with people in my life. So, um, and that includes the places that I live and the people that I work with, like, even if it's just a transient person in my life, you know, for a couple of days or something like that. Um, I don't want to be a place of fast, uncaring <laughs> energy. Um, so, yeah, so little ripples that I do, um, I hope that they ripple out as much as they can and that other people can take up that space too. Thanks. I wonder if folks have questions. There aren't any Q&A questions that have popped up yet. Um, I, if it's okay, going to ask another question and hopefully we, we get some things in from the audience as well. But I also feel that uh, everything that's come out in the last few minutes of, of uh, answering the questions Nazrin and I have had have also just uh, been really enriching and I'm so grateful for. So I'm going, I'm going to keep asking questions. Um, I, I also, um, I'm really interested in like the ideas of intimacy um, and the way that, that you presented them in your writings um, in the, you know, that the, the really um, detailed descriptions of like where a hand was placed on the, the canoe of the, the um, like the weaving tools and the, the knowing of um, someone's loom versus your loom and like, and, and um, wow, like the, sorry, I'm like kind of overwhelmed by like the thoughts of like how um, you can know someone so intimately, but then thinking about knowing their tools that intimately, which is like a whole new level of intimacy with that person. Um, because, you know, in my life, no one uses my crafting or art making tools, but me generally. So the idea that you would know those things um, and such a beautiful way of presenting intimacy. Um, and I guess I'm just mostly asking if you could talk a little bit more about the ways that you choose to represent intimacy in writing. Yeah. Um, so I think part of thinking, part of being a person who thinks a lot about bodies um, and senses um, and access and care, um, I think a lot of times about um, yeah, intimacy. And like, so I think about how 
can what I know about my body, about what, how can I know about my need, what, how can what I know about my needs or, um, you know, my capacities or whatever, be a resource um, to allowing someone else to have that space, to have that option, to have that, um, you know, opportunity. And so if that's just like, you know, knowing to have the right size chairs at my house so that my super fat, fat my super fat friends can come over. Like, that's just like this little thing that maybe that's just between the two of us. But like, if that's something that we both are able to, you know, we're able to radiate and feel strong about because it's happening in our, we're, be, we're having our needs met. The more we have our needs met with each other, the kind of like, like the stronger we get in being able to like ask for what we need in a world that doesn't, give us what we need. And so I feel like um, being able to know, being able to think about what someone else might need to access my work um, is me thinking really intimately about everyone who might be coming across it. Um, and I don't know everyone who's coming across it. And so I try to think of all the different ways that um, um, I, in my lifetime, you know, in my circle of experience, know that bodies can experience um, and when you're disabled and you're someone who, or you're someone who just needs a lot of help, you don't always get to, you know, orchestrate exactly how, what that help looks like or, um, or who's doing it or how it's done. And so there's a lot of forced intimacy among, on disabled people to just live and to just have their basic needs meant to have our basic needs met. And so, you know, what I've learned through, yeah, what I've learned through disability justice is like building these relationships and these networks and these connections of intimacy that can like push back against that and can to and can offer alternatives to that um, and can um, yeah, can uh, kind of shake loose the barriers that make people think that they don't need anything to exist and, and that certain people do and that because they do they're different and hard and we can't do it and it costs money and when actually we all need something to be here but we just have to think more intimately, intimately about how each other experiences. Thanks for that uh, so much. We do have a couple questions coming in. Um, I'll, I'll do the first one and then I'll let Nazrin uh, read the second one after you've answered. So um, the first one is, I also found the tortoise resonant and something that strikes me is not just the slowness of the tortoise, but their fierceness when need be. They're strong and they can bite your finger off. Um, what you're talking about now, about being able to listen, to be slow enough to hear, um, this is a powerful constellation of knowingness. So I'm curious about how you draw the line in your work, the, the searing, honest naming of the manifestations of colonial practice, and how do you hold back? Oh, that is a, thank you for that <laughs> thoughts. It's a very big question. Um, Hmm. I think when I think about just holding back, which is kind of the first thing that popped in my mind, um, um, I think that an offering of care that I've been offered and that I try to think about um, in my work is that I'm trying not to actively hurt people. Um, I'm trying not to actively traumatize anybody. Um, and you know, if I am, then I want to give them the option to opt out if I, if that's what I'm choosing to do. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, um, thinking about uh, fierceness and hold, and you know, and what to, what to be, you know, forceful about or what to hold back. Um, I think through about what, how much, to kind of like balance how much um, I want to experience the pain of the thing that I'm writing about, which is often somewhat painful already. Um, and how much uh, pain I'm asking the reader or the experiencer to, um, to sit with. 
Um, and so that's, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Erica. <laughs> Um, I get to ask the next question, um, which is from Anu. Hi, Anu. Um, though your work is so multi inter transdisciplinary, would you feel comfortable to share how you came to poetry or how poetry came to you? Yeah, so um, I kind of describe my practice like if um, I'm not a painter, but if I had a painting palette, um, and I had the palette and I had a bunch of different paint colors on it and a brush, um, the palette itself is poetry. Um, everything, everything is filtered through, comes through, inspired by, um, referenced by research, something like that feels like uh, is, is poetry to me, um, is, is how I kind of think through things and so, if that manifests in film or in textiles or in performance um, or in sculpture, um, then uh, that's kind of how the kind of transdisciplinariness has grown. Um, yeah, but I feel like I've I'm, I've written poetry since I was at least nine. Um, I still have that poem, <laughs> and um, it's always been. It's always been the place that language exists when I can't, when I don't have anywhere to talk to, when I don't have anyone to speak to, um, when I can't, when there isn't a place to share the thing that I need to express, um, which was a lot of experiences when I was little. So that's kind of, kind of how poetry came to me. Awesome. Um, so our next question is Mel, are there uh, directions that you want to go in your creative work um, that you're scared of um, or excited about? Hi, E.T. Um, yes, I want to make really big things that I don't know how to make yet. <laughs> um, I really, um, I really want to make spaces that are just like that have like a room for smells and have a room where you can like stick your hands in like dirt and there's like a wet space and like it's all the same exhibition because it's the same thing but you're just experiencing it in different ways and I don't know how to make those things happen yet but like so far I'm working on films and, and sculptures and um and yeah and so I really I really want to explore more ways that um even work that I've already created can be revisited and can be like, um, you know, work that's only been text, can it be touched? Like work that's only been, you know, film, can it be read? Like, um, and uh, I think that's kind of some of the things that I'm trying to play with and possibly, yeah, directions that I'm going forward in. Yeah, excited about. Amazing. Um, I love that, the way you described the smell room <laughs> and in, in the dirt room. <laughs> like, I want to be there right now. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there with you. For sure. exactly. <laughs> um, the next question. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your poetry and thoughtful reflections. Can I ask how you express intimacy and embroidery together, I guess? Yeah. Um, I ex well, um, when I think about one of the, my favorite intimacies with embroidery, um, so uh, I have access to my hearing and there's this little series of sounds that happens when you're um, embroidering and like the material is like the right kind of taut um, and the needle is sharp and like the thread is like the right thickness and there's just like pop and then whew, when it comes through and I just can't get enough of it. And I feel like so, <laughs> I just, I get excited when it's gonna happen, um, when it's like quiet enough when I'm into it. And it feels, um, it feels so personal and feels like so um, vulnerable of all these like little bits that are kind of talking to each other in ways that I may not even heard or thought to listen to like 10 years ago. Um, but uh, for me, like, as much as I'm able to, I hope that my, I try to make my textile work, especially my embroidery 
uh, tactile friendly when it's exhibited. So obviously we can't really do that right now. Um, so I'm trying to think of other ways that that's possible, but uh, usually in terms of kind of expressing int intimacy with my embroidery, when I'm making it, I'm really trying to think of what it feels like. Um, and I'm not trying to think through it. It just kind of is what it is. Like I just, that's how I like to make things. I like to make things that feel, um, that you can feel, run your hands across or like, um, you know, run a mic across or experience in kind of a pretty, uh, pretty close up way um, because it is so fine. So yeah, I feel like just like generally embroidery has, um, invites me to be intimate with it. Mm -hmm. We don't have another question, but we just had an awesome thank you next level, which I mm -hmm. love. I love that comment. Um, I guess, uh, you know, um, as we're sort of wrapping up, I want to also make sure that through everything that we've, you know, you've been able to talk about this evening, that you've been able to present everything that you wanted to. Um, is there any anything that you would like to leave us with this evening that you haven't gotten to already? Um, there was another poem I was thinking about. Um, and so uh, uh, I can tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about this poem as I get it. Um, so my, uh, my first uh, textile exhibition point of origin, um, when I made it, I knew it was a mix of quilts and tapestries and poems. And um, it just kind of came through that it would be the number of quilts that it was going to be. Um, it's going to be the number of tapestries it was going to be. I didn't know how to do tapestries. I didn't know how to weave at the time, but I had, I learned. Um, and I knew that they were, I knew that they were poems, the quilts were poems. Um, and so, uh, you know, things take time. It was, I worked on that show for like a year and so, um, and I'm working on it and I'm sewing and I'm like, okay, it's in like six months. Like you got to write these poems. Okay. And then it's like sewing, 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 sewing. And it's like, okay, it's like four months. You got to like write these poems. And I'm like, totally, totally, totally. So, so, so. And then it's like, like two months. And I'm like, it, I'm almost done the sewing. Like, let me just do the sewing. And I got the poems are like, they're happening. It's totally good. Like, so, so, so. And then it's like a month and it's like, okay, Mel. So like, we're getting ready to install. Yep, 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 yep. Um, so I got to write these poems. It's totally fine. It's like, a week, two weeks, three weeks out. Um, and I'm still sewing because it, you know, things took forever. Um, and uh, I got through most, I got through most of the, um, most of the sewing. Um, and uh, then one night over, like over kind of a dawn, <laughs> like a night to dawn situation, um, I'm pretty, I'm a nerd, so I sat at my typewriter and all poems came out in order. Um, and uh, they've, you know, they've been like, you know, edited and whatever a little bit, but like they pretty much have stayed the same uh, since they were written. Um, and it was such a, it was such a like um, full process. Like it, it just really felt like the words were there the whole time. It was just, um, it was just, yeah, I just had to give them the opening. I had to give them the page. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and so I've just kind of followed that co muse collaboration energy and it's led me to make other things <laughs> and to write other things um, and feel like things are super clear and feel like things are gonna take five years or 10 and um, just really, uh, yeah, just really been, um, trying to sit sit more calmly and like more with ease about about slowness and about about the stuff taking time so um let me get this is there any other um there was one more comment is yeah great yeah so uh really grateful to be invited into your work and experience you had uh, you had um it had been a while hearing you talk about the link between consensual relationships slowing down and intimacies resonated deeply in my heart and I'm always excited about how I feel about uh, your work ripple 
how your how I feel that your work ripples into my brain, body, mind. I feel so held. Thank you, Jasmine. That means so much. Oh, these comments are just my little Scorpio heart. <laughs> Um, I have one question, but it's super, um, well, my, okay, my question is, <laughs> um, I always love to hear about what people are reading, and since you're a poet, I want to know what you've been reading, if you have been reading, or what you've been watching, if that's yeah. what you're also mostly doing, which is I've wonderful. been doing both of those things. Um, <laughs> I have been, as I often do, I've been rereading Audre, Audre Lorde. Undersong is my favorite collection of hers. Um, but I just uh, recently um, gifted myself a new, like a, I didn't have a copy of her full, like of the complete works. Um, and so I just uh, got that a little while ago. And so I've been kind of like, just holding that, <laughs> just like being like, we're getting ready. Yeah, um, so going back to, um, going back to Audre Lorde. And um, and I've been watching a lot of old comfort things. I'm about to admit to the world, not just the people that know me through my cell phone, that I watch Grey's Anatomy every single year from the beginning. And so that's where I'm at right now. So um, that's one of the things that I do uh, for self care. And uh, I know a few other folks that do it. I know other queers do it. It's, you know, we say that we don't, it's terrible. It's like one of the worst shows, but I will watch every season until it's over. Yeah. Um, so that's something else that I do. Um, and uh, I just watched the um, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina for the first time. I didn't care for that. Oh, um, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> but, oh. but I did it. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am. I also watch Grey Anatomy, so <laughs> I'm happy. You I believe it. <laughs> um, and the other thing I I've been listening to um, is N.K. Jemisin's the uh, fifth season uh, uh, series again because I just can't get enough of how it's read. I love the plot. I love the characters. Um, I've already listened to it. I think twice this year, but um, it's just one of my favorite series. So I read that again. Nice. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. So we do have one more question if you want oh, yes. to take one from yes. Mariana. Um, Mel, thanks for all that you are sharing tonight. Maybe you already addressed this. I'm wondering if you have anything you'd like to say about using a physical process like quilting, sewing, etc., to connect with human ancestors, current friends, non human kin, future kin, or to rephrase about finding connection through physical acts. Yes, yes, thank you for that question. Um, one of my mentors, Indira um, Allegra, one of the first times that I met her, she um, spoke about, they spoke about patterns and prints and, um, and cloth being our ancestral hard drives and being like the, the, the things, part of the things that kind of hold stories and hold um, histories and hold memories and hold like future memories, like in just imaginings and dreams. Um, and I've really thought about that a lot um, in the past few years and uh, think about, yeah, kind of think about that when, I, when I'm looking at colors or patterns or when I'm working with particular materials um, I think a lot about where, um, where the cloth is coming from when I'm, when I'm handling it, depending on if it's, if I, if I bought it, if it's secondhand, if it was gifted, and then like where it came from before that. Um, and, um, I, like a lot of folks that are soists, I don't know, wouldn't consider myself a soist, I guess, because I'm not skilled in other so to see ways, but um, you know, like, oh, like my mom taught me to sew or I grew up watching my mom or I grew up watching my grandma or whatever. Um, and I didn't get the opportunity to grow up with my mom. Um, and, uh, but I did kind of know that my aunt and my grandmas um, sewed and that they crocheted 
um, and knitted and I learned like, you know, bits and bobs um, growing up, but it was, um, it just always made sense as a thing to know how to do like um and so it was like you just have a sewing kit um and i just always had some sewing project going as a kid and um you know as i've grown thinking about quilts and growing into weaving and um thinking about different materials and different colors um it feels so um it feels impossible not to think about history and not to think about um, ancestors when I'm working with cloth um, because even as you're making it, as I'm making it, I'm like, this may live for a hundred more years. Like, you know, what am I putting, what am I putting of myself into this that, do I want this to live? Do I want to make it out of something that's going to live? Do I want to make it out of something that's going to disintegrate? Um, and and thinking too about like the more I work with cloth and the more I think about it, um, just in having more conversations with myself about the kind of ancestor I want to be um, and the kind of, you know, yeah, ancestorship I want to cultivate in the living part of my life. So um, I feel like, uh, I feel like it's been, yeah, a very connected, very um, electric sort of kinship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you still want one more poem or how are folks feeling? <laughs> okay. Um, so this poem is the um, is the first poem from Point of Origin um, and the corresponding quilts is a uh, representation of my birth chart, my astrological birth chart. Um, and so I made a giant version of my birth chart and stitched it by hand and it took a year. Um, but um, that's what this one, it's kind of bright pink. Um, uh, and so uh, this poem makes some references to dying, uh, to death and, um, and bodies, body fluids. Mm. Yes. Older still, with a silent roar and a winter storm, I was ripped from my mother two months before I was due, Leo rising. Born out of panic, my mother's and my own, I demanded to survive. Tracing my newly formed fingers along the red ribbons pathways, my older sister had made two years before, only this time the baby came out breathing. The quality of my first breath came from the oxygen being gently forced into my tiny frame. My lungs weren't ready, they weren't ready for the taupe toned recirculated air of Women's College Hospital. We needed more time my lungs, my heart, my soft and stretching bones. We needed more time. My soul, my mother, our union, Scorpio sun. Both my mother and myself have sons that live in the sign of Scorpio. She was born in Halloween and for the better part of my childhood that had me convinced that she was a witch in addition to being a ghost. As an adult, I don't discount her potential for good witchery and owe at least half of my magic to her. I used to look up to the suburban sky past my window frame and the wires lining threading hydro towers together to pick up the star that must have been her saying hello. I didn't know then that the stars we see are long faded shadows of stars that have lived and died billions of years ago. I also didn't know then that time is not linear. We needed more time. Submerged safely inside of her skin, surrounded by warm water and the echoes of her effervescent expressions to the world. 
crouched inside the smallest me, my soul grew its gold green light pulsing softly through my veins, racing like a river through a blue mountain, pulling past life histories and unknown ancestries into my core, my blood, my heart, where they would live and live on. Like waking from a falling dream, heart racing, body rigid in anticipation of impact, the fear I felt in my mother when the doctor told her I'd stopped growing had gotten quiet and still shattered my amniotic anchorage. Warm water turned cool, every running stream slowed down, blood, tears, spinal fluid, soul. Everything got so cold and so still before suddenly becoming so much colder, brighter, louder, we needed more time and ever since I have missed those safe warm waters. Scorpio moon. Magic brought my soul back into my core not too long ago. Magic and kinship and giving into intuition. It's been a long time without a connection to my own soul. We have a lot to catch up on. We have so much time to catch up. If not in this lifetime, the next will do. Thank you so much again. Thank you everybody for your wonderful questions. And thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you so much, Mel. So much gratitude to having you here. Um, so although our, our evening or our portion of our evening with Mel is, is coming to an end. The whole evening doesn't have to end because uh, Melanie is giving an artist talk uh, with the Manitoba Craft Council at 7.30. So wow, amazing that we don't have to leave you yet. Um, and so you can go to the Manitoba Craft Council's website and uh, get information there. Um, and we'll see you all there. Um, I also just want to uh, give a reminder to everyone that our next event is uh, December 3rd, um, when we will be fortunate enough to spend the evening uh, with Wanda Nanabush. So please go to the Gallery 1CO3 or uh, plug in ICA website for further information about um, that talk. Um, just Not so me. grateful. Oh, oh sorry, Nazarin, go ahead. I just wanted to do a an extension of that plugin because Wanda, although we know her often as being a curator and a writer, will actually be giving us an artist talk and showing us some of her films. So it's definitely a not to be missed event. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. amazing. So thank you. I can't wait to uh, join for the next talk, Mel, and um, I, I'm sure it'll go amazing. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone soon. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Hope to see you soon. <laughs>